Accountants basically have probably more access to data than any other person in the business. The fear was that maybe data scientists would come into this space. For the life of me, the average person in the street would not think that accountants are potentially on the front lines of actually working on the sustainability agenda and making sure the people are being held to account. Hello and welcome to the Gross Profit Podcast. My name is James Kennedy. I'm the CEO and co-founder at procurementexpress.com. We're the purchasing software that takes the hassle out of managing your company spend with magical features, but that's not what we are here to talk about today. Today, you should listen to this podcast if you have graduated with an accountancy qualification more than five years ago because since that in the last five years, things have changed dramatically and they're gonna change even more. To talk about that, I've invited along Ian Brown from Chartered Accountants Ireland to chat about this. So Ian, I really appreciate you coming along to talk to us today. Maybe you could just introduce yourselves to the listeners and tell us a bit about your background. James, thanks a million for having me here. Uh, delighted to come along. My background is I'm the Director of Education at Chartered Accountants Ireland. Um, and Chartered Accountants Ireland are the, the uh, professional membership body of Chartered Accountants for the whole island of Ireland. Uh, and then we're established back in 1888 with a royal charter that was signed by Queen Victoria. So obviously, if we went right back to our uh, start, uh, foundation, uh, a lot has changed. And, and then in ways, certain things have always stayed constant and the same. Certainly in the last sort of five to six years, there's been a, a massive explosion in the deployment of new technologies in the profession. Okay, well, before we get into that, I'm gonna ask some some level set questions because I'm not an accountant, as you know. So a chartered accountant in Ireland, so is that similar to a CPA in the US would be someone who's qualified as an accountant? Is it is it a body or is it a qualification or who are, you know, what, what's the equivalent in the US or the UK, for example, or elsewhere around the world? Yeah, so in, in the US, uh, the equivalency would be sort of CPA uh, America, so AICPA. Um, in Canada, it would be uh, CPA Canada. Um, and also in terms of the UK, you'd have the likes of ICAEW and ICAS would be the professional governing bodies of the profession in those areas. They're, they're professional membership bodies. Um, so to become a qualified chartered accountant, you would go through uh, the education program with one of those professional bodies in those jurisdictions. So I guess as you're in charge of assessment, there's nothing you don't know about being an accountant. Why did they give you that job? But originally I would have been head of assessment and syllabus. Um, so that's setting the, all the exams and, and what the future syllabus might look like and the, the, the learning content that underpins that it's back in 2015. Uh, sort of over the last uh, three or four years, I've been deputy director of education. And then in the last sort of 12 months I've been director of education. So effectively anything to do with the educational needs and requirements, uh, because we are a regulated body, so we have to adhere to the regulations as well. But also we have to sort of future scan to make sure that the skills that uh, the future profession needs, that we are actually educating people to have those future skills. And like certainly in the last number of years, there's been quite a change in that. And you can see certainly see COVID accelerated a lot of technology deployment in all manner of fields, but in particular too in the accountancy profession. And that, that has had an impact. So like certainly we've had to look at our syllabus back in 2018 and we, we implemented new uh, teaching material in, in certain areas that we had identified as being blind spots at that time in our qualification for making sure that people had the requisite skills that were required to unlock the full benefits of their knowledge or, or create synergies in their business with the deployment of, of the technology tools that would be relevant to, to the profession. So we started to look at areas like data analytics, specifically through the lens of the accounting profession. So we were providing training that would be data analytics through the use of certain platforms that would allow people to be able to deploy 
tasks or, 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 or do functions in the roles that could add value on day one in the job. If I get this right, in 2017 or before, give me three or four of the things that I would not have been taught at all that really actually to be a modern accountant, you need to have. We did an industry scan and we looked at where the profession itself in the marketplace was evolving and where our syllabus was, which is the academic teaching that underpins that profession. And there was a, mis a slight mismatch. And that's normal in, in the profession to trail a couple of years behind where the market has gotten to because the market will move and react much quicker. But we identified key areas in the areas of, um, in the profession, uh, RPA was starting, starting in 2017, 18 to be deployed at some of the larger firms. I better stop you here. Every time there's a bit of jargon that I don't know, I'm just going to ask. So RPA, what, what's RPA? So RPA is robot process automation. So it's, it's a software tool to basically, um, automate repetitive functions that you might do on a day-to-day -day basis in your role. At that time in 2017, 18, no other professional body in accounting anywhere in the world actually taught the skills of RPA. So robot process automation. And if, first of all, we had to start with the basics in terms of, well, what is RPA and why is it important to the accountancy profession? So we, we ex explained that in terms of like, having your own personalized bot that can do a lot of the repetitive parts of your job. So to allow you freed up in time to be able to add more higher value add to your work. So to focus more on strategic uh, decision making or, you know, getting garnering much better insights into the particular data you may have been processing. So we, we started to develop a teaching plan working with a, a partner that we, we, we worked with in this, in the space at the time about teaching people. What could that do? So one of the things that we taught in the, in the, in the, at that time, we introduced it to syllabus in 2019 for all of our final stage accountants, uh, which, which to this day is still industry leading. It's still well ahead of, of, of what others are doing. Um, and what it allowed was, say, for example, at a simple level, if you were doing a payroll reconciliation and you had to do that every month or every quarter or supplier um, reconciliation, statement reconciliations, like we were looking at scenarios where for big corporates, that could take somebody a couple of days to do. And one particular task we put into our learning materials was where uh, trainees will be expected on their job to do that manually over a period of three or four days. And that, that could be done by teaching our students to create their own RPA bot using the UiPath license. So it's very practical of how they could automate a part of their day job in their organization that could basically automate something that took days into minutes. That's a great coup for UiPath, a commercial entity, I guess, to get a built into the training. How is that deal done or how do you make sure that you maintain your independence or is that important is it just about getting the job done so we didn't just happen upon say ui path in the area of rpa and um, what we found was when we went out to the industry uh, and and in the marketplace commercially all the majors were starting either starting or had just finalized back in 2017-18 a personalized rpa license with ui path for their, their staff globally so if that's what like most of the major multiples were going to be using, they were actually having access to these tools in their day job. However, they weren't receiving training in our program to be able to deploy them. They were receiving, going to receive in-house training and working uh, with our, our, our major uh, firms, our major customers. Um, what we were able to do was augment the in-house training. So it meant that somebody could be much more effective and almost rather than having trainees on the job sort of crawl, creeping and crawling before they walk, we were able to at least get them to the walk or, or starting the, the light jog um, and add value quicker in the organization. We work hand in glove with our training firms and partners. Uh, and it, it's key uh, for us that like people are getting the skills that are actually relevant to the roles. So like to give you an example as well of how we turn that RPA in our own systems. So just uh, last year, 2023, we have our kind of admissions process, which basically if we're taking in a new trainee, we might offer exemptions. And that process was a manual process that had five or six staff. And um, effectively, 
they would take all the applications with about 2,000 a year coming in. And when we were a busy period, we had sometimes backlogs of six, eight, seven weeks uh, upwards of a really bad peak times, 12 weeks uh, to respond to say, we've assessed your application and we, on the basis of our assessment, we're, we're going to potentially grant you some exemptions or not. Now, the response time for that then was slow enough and it had been thus forevermore. So we decided, well, let's look at, can we take this RPA learning and turn it on ourselves? We deployed that bot last year uh, and that bot actually reduced processing time of exemptions for somebody who would apply from weeks down to, in some cases, less than an hour. One of the other things we identified was there was nobody in the profession globally really teaching in any meaningful way the the art or skills of proper data analytics. We knew that at the firm level, firms had software solutions, both in terms of Altrix and Tableau, uh, where the two people we identified the profession were using highly. So we, we partnered with those two bodies and we developed teaching content around data analytics and data visualization so that people could garner the best insights that could get possibly out of the data that they were uh, crunching. We wanted to create where data was being done dynamically. Uh, and then um, we introduced that to, to the course back in 2019. And that's been hugely effective. It's been really well received. And then how did we turn that in on ourselves? We wanted to be able to report on it a learner's journey. Because remember now, if I'm a large accountancy practice, they may be sending us four, five, six hundred trainees a year at different levels. And they, they need to know how those trainees are progressing through their learning journey. And to do that, you need to be, you have large amounts of data and you need to be able to do it in a way that's kind of almost create a self-serving system, which we managed to do for uh, about 30 top uh, firms. Uh, where they have a dashboard at all times dynamically that can actually track their trainee's learning journey throughout their learning with us. Now, I would say to you, that was in 2019, 2020, that certainly was cutting edge. But what we see now is that we're now all already moving to the next evolution of that, which is, is to move more into the adaptive learning kind of space where everyone has their own unique journey within in that and the data analytics that flow off of that will be much more thorough and, and uh, meaningful. So but that's, that's, that's the evolution that's to come. You touched on something there I hadn't heard before. So adaptive analytics, is that what you called it? Yeah, it's, a, it's adaptive learning rather than having linear homogeneous uh, educational experiences. So like if you think what you would have done historically, you started a course in you know, week one, and it was if it was a 14 week course per se, there was a class of 100 students or 500 students to progress linearly through that. So you had your week one lectures, your week one tasks, and so on and so forth. Well, what adaptive learning is, it actually adapts to everyone's individual learning needs and styles and what works best for everyone. So, for example, James is a smart cookie. James has covered some of the content before. James doesn't need to sit through a particular course in adaptive learning, parts of the course that it already assesses through analytics that you already had some basis of knowledge. So you can effectively get through your learning faster. But what it also does is, is it creates individual learning journey maps for each learner. So if we currently have in the region of five to 6,000 active students, Rather than looking at a student uh, cohort as a, a macro body, we can, yes, absolutely, we can see at the macro level what how students are engaging and learning. But now going forward, we're going to be able to take that down to the micro level too. Not alone can I see how well James is doing overall at his macro level. I can actually see that James is struggling on items 1.1.1 1 .1 and 3.6.4. And we can actually take a scalpel to the learning and say, look, James, you really need to focus on these pieces. Now that's all technology enabled. You can't do that with humans in the system. So it's kind of counterintuitive to think that the deployment of more technology actually makes a more unique human journey and a better experience at a human level. It's, it's counterintuitive. 
So this is getting way outside of traditional accounting and into operations and adding value to the business. Even your IT folks mightn't have the analytical skills for, or, you know, the salespeople by the sense of it wouldn't have the skills for. So who's left, right? And those people with a financial understanding and a systems I guess a systems understanding. We looked at it in the philosophical sense, in the conceptual sense, which is like, you know, how can this be used and, and why, why should accountants uh, be looking in this space? Well, first of all, accountants basically have probably more access to data than any other person in the business in terms of being able to take that data and put it into meaningful kind of information for, for, for decision making. So the, the fear at the time was that maybe data scientists would come into this space. In the future, in the finance department, you have more data scientists than you have accountants. We took a view that that's probably the wrong way to look at it because, again, data scientists will come in and they don't understand the rules of double entry bookkeeping or how sets of accounts are uh, constructed and, and utilized and they don't know um, the particular financial reporting standards or the auditing standards that go with said same. So it was always going to be easier to create a, an environment where accountants through the right training, which is you don't need to know everything that you need to know to be a data scientist, but you need to be able to know enough that you can extract the value out of what you're doing. Um, and what we found was what we tried to create in our learning uh, journey was to create a Rosetta Stone. So that acted as the go between, between data science and the accountancy profession. And somewhere in between, there's the sweet spot. Accountants could extract the value from the, the skills that they would require in the, in the fields and be able to sit in a room with any data scientist and talk, talk to a fairly good level on it uh, and not get bogged down in the jargon. Um, but, but not know everything that a data scientist would do. The key thing is if you're building solutions and we talk about, you know, software as a service and that, if you're building solutions for organizations, they, there needs to be a Rosetta Stone element to anything that you do, because there's no point in you giving a company, an organization, a technology solution that they then need to be a computer programmer to deploy. So most interfaces are designed so they can be almost drop and drag once you have a certain level of proficiency. Now, historically, if you don't teach at all, if you're completely silent as a profession on, we don't teach you any of those Rosetta Stone pieces, you need to be able to translate that. Then there's the fear factor comes in. So then like literally people will be slow to adapt technologies that are already there to be deployed to unlock synergies. And, and we found from talking to counterparts in, in the United States who worked with advising very, very large multinationals on their finance departments and the, the, the deployment of technology tools to be able to, to get, get better value and better insights from their financial data. They had the tools, but the staff had not got the springboard set of skills that they would need to be able to understand how to start deploying it. So there was a frustration level at large corporates. They had technologies, but they couldn't get them utilized uh, and realized. So we wanted to start create that bridge. Uh, and we and we started that in 2019. And that has continued to evolve. And it's about to evolve again now in our next iteration of our qualification. There's two sides here. One is that there sometimes, let's face it, the accountancy department has a bit of an ivory tower reputation sometimes where the witches and the warlocks and the Harry Potter incantations are done and poof, you got your, your profit at the end of the month, three months later or whatever. And it's worse the incantation. And I've seen it <clears throat> not two million miles away where the accounts, you know, is a totally different, like basically there's, in my mind, there's getting your tax paid and then there's operating a business. And those same things actually do not have as much in common. And a lot of traditionally, let's say, I would have said there would have been a bend towards paying the tax and staying out of jail. That was the accountancy job. job. And what you're talking about sounds a lot more exciting to work with because there's a growing here on the other side of it. If you were used to sitting behind your spreadsheet, guess what? You're going to have to go out and find out what those numbers meant or actually figure out, oh, hold on, this GL means that like yeah and suddenly it all becomes real so it's a meeting in the middle you know and i guess if you're hiring an accountant who are you going to hire you're going to hire someone who's been trained in the old way 
or someone who's actually a lot more hands-on. It's the starting of a, a kind of a ground shift. And every every long journey starts with the first steps. And I think in 2019, when we deployed our new teaching and learning in these areas, we started the first baby steps on the journey towards over time changing the the attitudes and perceptions of what it is the accountant would do in an organization and the kind of skills they'd bring on day one to that journey. Interestingly enough, I think like the people that qualified more than five years ago, they are either at the start of entering into becoming the more key decision makers in the business now as they get promoted up through the ranks. Or if you're now at finance director or CFO level, you may have been trained quite a number of years ago. Um, and it's just been, been able to access learning tools and educational programs that give you specific knowledge that's relevant to your area, actionable knowledge, actionable intel. So rather than just sending somebody off at the CFO level or finance director to be able to say, look, I don't have these skills from, from, from a, they weren't part of my original training. Uh, and I, like, I need to now go back to my lifelong learning piece, but I want to be able to find a place where I can go that I get that actionable knowledge, something that I can bring back to my business after having attended a couple of sessions on say RPA. And I now look at my business uh, at the macro level and say, we should be really thinking about these processes here, here, and here about how we deploy RPA and what that would do both to the efficiency and effectiveness of the organization, but then also maybe drive overall profitability going forward in a different way. Okay, so you're not a lost cause if you're a CFO with 15 years experience. Uh, lifelong learning comes in here and the, the, the Charge Association helps with that. Yes, we also have that element string to our bow. Uh, and I'd, like, I would encourage anyone that if they have a fear factor or like people would say, well, generative AI and you know what's that doing to the area of analytics now and the role of the accountant? And like a lot of people, there's this misconception that generative AI is purely chat GPT and it's not. But for somebody who's like, and I'm, I'm a qualified accountant. So like for me, these were all, I didn't have that in my training when I was uh, qualifying. So I've had to upskill myself as I've gone through this piece as well. Um, and what you will see is that it doesn't need to have that level of fear if it's explained to you in a really meaningful way that's relevant to you, to you, that you can see almost immediately the benefit and, and the power that that brings to somebody to be able to go back and say, like particularly in, in, in our organization as well at the moment, we're looking at deploying RPA now to our finance function and our members function um, to actually speed up processes there. We're a membership body, so it'll add to the membership experience but also in terms of be able to, for us to be able to more agile and identify key areas of need going forward um, and be able to apply our resources, which are scarce, scarce resources, in a more meaningful way to actually make a bigger impact or difference. So, but they, they are all achieved through automation, data analytics, having uh, decisions bounded in data. So they're data-driven decisions and also allowing key decision makers in organizations the time to actually the headspace because having worked in industry in large corporates, uh, multinationals as well, a lot of your time gets has historically been taken up in actually preparing the set of financials uh, every month maybe or every quarter and then actually creating the management pack of insights to make decisions going forward. Like, but generative AI tools uh, with data analytics now can prepare most at 70, 80% of that almost instantaneously. So now you actually, as a management team, you have the time to absorb that data and make better decisions then. And ultimately, if that's done on a macro scale globally, that will turn the dial on global GDP levels in every major jurisdiction. It has to, because GDP is dictated by the aggregation of individual corporates' outcomes. And if they have slight a 1% increase in outcomes for every organization in a jurisdiction, impacts GDP, which is good for society as a whole. And we mustn't lose sight of that, that the profession here has the ability 
to actually act in a really meaningful way to drive prosperity forward for society as a whole. Um, it, it's not just, oh, the boring accountants and there's the lad at the end of the bar that nobody wants to sit with. You're, you do meaningful work. And that probably gets us to where the future is evolving, which is sustainability. When I would have come to the Institute back in 2015, sustainability and how it was being discussed or the ESG journey was at a different stage to where it is now with the CRSD directive in the EU. So, and it's the, in the Irish um, piece and in most of Europe, it is the accountancy profession and in particular the auditing profession that is tasked with attesting and assuring sets of accounts and uh, annual reports for, uh, for large corporates uh, to say that they are being held, held accountable to their claims that they're making. Now that's good for society. So that's a huge move forward. We're looking at that now. So we brought in in 2019 as well. We started to bring, evolve a very comprehensive ESG set of le uh, learning for our trainees and also having uh, some form of that deployed too for our CPD lifelong learners. But that, that particular agenda, to do that properly, because now you're assessing basically the value chain of, of an organization, right? If you went into any accountancy department, now and I will leave the assurance and the auditing side out, but if you were working in a large corporate, it's hard enough I've been that soldier. I've been in the trenches. It's hard enough to turn out your monthly set of accounts or your quarterly or your half year, your year end, just for your own organization. So you're telling me now I've got to now look and make sure that everything that's happening down my value chain all adds up. And like, so if we're making statements at our level, so you need to be able to be proficient. Either you're going to add a, a lot more people into the mix to be able to get that information or you're going to do it in a much smarter way. An RPA and data analytics act as a complementary tool set and skill set to be able to really meaningfully um, bring to life uh, the ESG agenda. Like this is why if people say to me, you know, I never really imagined that like when I, I hear the, the whole sustainability uh, conversation, for the life of me, the average person in the street would not think that accountants are potentially on the front lines of actually working on the sustainability agenda and making sure that people are being held to account. I find it fascinating that policymakers have been using accountants uh, to influence society in a lot of different ways, right? Obviously, tax is one way here in Ireland, you know, like the, you're half, half policeman, half clients, you know, you have all sorts of responsibilities that other professions don't get put on them, you know. And now with ESG, it's no exaggeration to say, and if I've got my marketing head, is the future of the planet depends on our ability to manage the environment properly and sustainably. And the accountants are at the very front line of this, you know. Do you think that's overreach by the policymakers? Why make it the accountancy to professions problem? I think there's a very good reason why you would have the accountants more holistically involved in this in this uh, piece, right? Po at a policy level, the people who actually drive profitability uh, and actually provide information to senior managers, and a lot of accountants actually don't end up uh, working in the finance function in businesses. A lot of very senior accountants end up being either COOs, CIOs, um, and CEOs. So this is why it's critically important, right? So going forward, we have to make sure we are going to be as a profession central in this agenda. We need to make sure that the future profession has the skills, number one, to understand their place and what, what their role is in making sure that that agenda runs smoothly. So we have an obligation to do that and we will do that. We'll make sure that people have the right skills, but if not accountants who, and the reason why I say that is because it's large corporates that are basically need to be, they, they, there's a, a huge element of that's where the pollution or, or, or you know, poor decision making may have come historically from. Well, those, the people who actually possess are custodians of all the actionable intel and data in an organization are actually the finance function. Um, and also, uh, the good thing about the accountancy profession is it has 
over its time when it harmonized all of the accountancy standards to say that this is how you treat certain types of assets all over the world. It has a track record for 60 or 70 years in doing that. Um, in, in the sustainability piece, I can see that something similar will occur with the sustainability standards. So there will be an, industry, an international global standard that will have to be applied to corporates in the same way as financial reporting had to be done. Uh, and we have a track record as a profession of delivering that kind of agenda in the past. And I think we're well placed to do it going forward. So that like how, uh, you know, a unit of carbon is measured or uh, in one jurisdiction is the same as in another, et cetera, et cetera. And it's interesting that like a lot of accountants in the auditing space in particular, I'm working for big uh, accountancy firms, are moving away from their traditional roles into large uh, roles in the sustainability space because they see that like over time, certain functions within the old historic financial financial uh, world are like what we talked about today being automated. So, you, you know, generative AI, uh, data analytics, doing a big chunk of what used to be done before. Now the regulation, like we can get into more detail on that. Regulation needs to catch up slightly on that, but that will come at some other stage. Um, they, they see that like by being involved in a meaningful way in the sustainability journey that we're about to embark on as a global society, there's relevance for another 30, 40 years. Because remember, the international uh, counting standards and auditing standards took decades to harmonize. And it'll be no different for sustainability standards. But never has there been more importance on on something to be done than this job of work. And I suppose, um, I believe anyway, that the accountancy profession, it's not, it's not the only one. Uh, but it's certainly a very, very key player in policy and monitoring going forward in this in this space. Measuring, you know, measuring that is tricky. Okay. Pounds a pound, a euro is a euro. We can all agree on that. Suddenly, when it comes into a kilogram of carbon and how that is measured, it's suddenly, you know, it's not comparable. I mean, I do see that at least if you track it, if even if your internal measure is inaccurate, if it's consistently inaccurate across across time, then you can manage that at least lower. At least we can all agree that if you're measuring it wrong, you're measuring it wrong and it's going down, that's better than not measuring it at all. At all. But I believe that's a very powerful force. I mean, I've seen that. I mean, we, you talk, touched on analytics there. It's a very, like a dashboards, for example, it's an extremely powerful tool for influencing actual behavior in the organization. I've seen it Many years ago, I used to run a voiceover agency, believe it or not, and uh, we used to have about hundreds of, hundreds of voiceovers on our website. And inevitably, we would charge them every year to be on our website. And inevitably, we would get lots of complaints, people saying, you know, I'm not getting enough work, which is sort of inherent in a marketplace. So what we did is we made them a dashboard. We said, hey, this is how many times your page has been viewed. This is how, many t how long your demos have been listened to. This is which de demos have been listened to most. And we never got hardly any complaints ever again after that because it changed the conversation from what are you doing for me to get me work to, oh, if I can just get more views on my page and make my demo better. And then, and then suddenly we were working on the same thing and that totally changed the business, made it a lot nicer to run that business. I'll tell you that much, but those dashboards don't underestimate the amount of influence you can exert, you know, like what gets measured, gets done, et cetera. Uh, and that's one of my favorite hacks. There's a huge power in the dashboard, right? I agree in that. But historically, to get that dashboard, the information to feed into that dashboard was a lot of manual work. And then it was almost out of date, whereas the tools there now can allow for that dashboard to be dynamic. And you don't have an army of people feeding into that function to make that happen. And that's the key, um, because there still are organizations like, and you know, that, that are using lots of people in a function to generate in actionable in information. Um, and there is a better way and there's a better use of scarce resource because the profession as a whole in the accounting world, uh, it's, it's getting harder and harder to attract talent. 
Um, and obviously then we've got to do things in a smarter way. Like if you went to the legal profession or any other profession, they'll say it's harder and harder to attract talent. But if you go back historically, you look at like 30 years ago, um, what sort of optionality was there out in the marketplace? I know my mum had a, had a view in terms of what you should go on and do. And there was probably three or four things on the list. And if you took the priesthood and banking out of it, uh, you, you, you know, and, and maybe a, uh, like a very senior civil servant with good pension. Like she was always looking for me to go into that. But there's been, there's such a wealth of things that people can do now. But one of the things that I think that is so exciting, so, so exciting, and I'm not sure people yet at the, at the grassroots have come to realize is that the accountancy profession will be at the front end of technology innovation. So it's almost as much about the technology uh, and the art of the possible and the creative side of that, that might light up people in a way that historically didn't think that that, that was something that occurred in the accountancy profession. The other thing that struck me as we were talking is that if you really care about the environment, probably the best job you could do would be to become an accountant and and then uh, find a find a place where you can have an impact. Yeah. If you want, if you want to make a real tangible impact on the sustainability agenda, there is no better place to actually do something that will matter at the moment than in the accountancy profession. And I think that's really important for us as an institute, and we will be doing this, is as we evolve, it's, it's actually saying that from a value based system that the values that are inherent in the profession are something that will align and very much speak to somebody coming up now who's in school or in college and going, yeah, my values are very much aligned to, to that ESG agenda. And, I, like I, and, 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 and making that connection to say, wow, I can, I can make a difference here. And the other thing too that the accountancy profession always did was there's very few other jobs that allow you to move into an organization at an early stage in your career and really see in great detail, you have to understand particular sectors, particular markets, you have to understand your competitors. And out of that, then you might see, well, I understand this market and I want to go this way in, in that market, or I've been exposed on my journey to other sectors that feed into our sector. Uh, or I've been exposed on other audits in other areas, and I re suddenly realized that like maybe I'd really like to pursue something over in the, the media se section or whatever. And that's happened historically for decades. Uh, and it's something that doesn't get maybe a lot of traction in, the gen in general society, that an awful lot of very senior accountants are in roles that are, like, are what would be considered quite far removed now from the traditional accountant's role. However, the skill sets that they gained on that journey are relevant because that's what makes them exceptionally good business leaders. I mean, there's zero chance I would have been an accountant coming out of college school, right? Not for me. I was a nerd. There was, I feel like we're cousins. I was a programmer, you know, not same branch of the tree maybe. And, but no way. But now having gone through, you know, running a small business, now it's one of my favorite parts of the month is actually getting the numbers, you know, uh, working with Billy, my accountant, um, and go, getting everything right. It's so powerful. There's a certain happy place in the busy work that can come with accountancy, you know, reconciliations and getting it all in and then getting your P&L out. And, you know, you, you feel like that's the work, but that's not really the work. The work after that is now what? You know, that, that's all pointless. OK, pay your tax bill and then. But it's pointless unless you can actually make some use of that information. And if you don't, it's literally the difference between life and death, right? So for that organization, like if you get it wrong, it's over. And or if you get it wrong, if you don't even get it wrong, if the other guy does it better, it's over. Like it's, you know, they will be using AI. They will be using, you know, these tools. They will be, they'll be competing. Your competitors, as I'd like to think of, my competitors would like to think every single one of my customers, if they could, and if we're not as good as we possibly can be in every function, accountancy, sales, marketing, programming, if we're not all as working as hard as we can, then they will. They'll come and take them all. And that's one of the focuses that we're changing uh, in terms of our mindset philosophy for the, the education of the future profession is 
it used to be historically about now i know there's like the profession like there's the auditing side of it which was attesting to the sets of accounts but it, 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 it it's about maximizing shareholder wealth like so making sure that everyone's in compliance with their tax bills and everything is legit that's fine but in the future what we're trying to change that mindset is to it's about creating people with the skill sets or educating people to have the skill sets and a mindset about creating long-term sustainable value creation and that's so that's to your point to get to to get to your set of accounts and your set of numbers at the year end per se that's where that stops but most of the most of the actual value add is in the long-term sustainable value creation that occurs after that event and if we get that right society as a whole will benefit that's great i have one more question i want to finish up with um which is you touched there on how the regulation is catching up to the use of ai tools so tell me about that what what do people need to be aware of before they gallop off and start using chat gbt to help them do the reconciliations i suppose probably generative ai is like you know you don't need to listen to me you go listen to uh, uh like of elon musk and he'll say oh it's moving too fast, the regulation take too long to catch up. He's on next week. Don't worry about it. It's fine. Well, you can ask him that one. <laughs> but um, the, so generative AI is probably a little bit moving faster. I, I remember in 2018 meeting with some of the most senior people in the auditing profession in Ireland. And the, there was technology tools back then, and they were probably even old at that stage, where historically the international auditing standards are all about uh, pulling samples uh, to, to attest to something and to run your auditing tests. But technology had moved on. So the firms could actually take your data dump of your full general ledger, uh, sets of accounts, and they could effectively sample 100% of all of the transactions in a multinational and see that particular transaction that happened at 2.30 in the morning uh, doesn't seem right. And it would pull all of that exceptions out for them. But they actually couldn't apply that to their actual official uh, audit uh, uh, review and exercise. So the international auditing standards will have to evolve and they will probably over the next five to 10 years where they'll start to allow for 100% testing. Uh, but at the moment they're still within, they still talk to the old world order where it's you pull a sample uh, and the X reasons decide what that level of sample is that's the way they're written, but they're written to an old world. Technology has surpassed that, but that that's normal. The regulation will catch up, and see when it does. Well, that fundamentally changes then how audits are performed around the world. The firms are frustrated because they have these tools and they can't actually really deploy them fully to get the full use out of them. So they're mainly used then for more managerial reporting than actual the compliance side of the business. Ian, thanks very much for that. This has been really interesting. I get unreasonably interested and excited about talking to these topics. I don't know what's wrong with me, but uh, where can people find out more, reach out to you, maybe brush up through their existing training? Do you need to be based in Ireland? Can you be somewhere else? Tell us a bit more about that. Yeah, so like um, the key thing here is that like obviously I'm accessible in Chartered Accountants Ireland um, and we're there in Pier Street in Dublin and also in Belfast, but my email address is Ian, I-A-N dot B-R-O-W-N-E at charteraccountants.ie. Uh, obviously, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, very much happy to discuss where the future of the profession is moving or where people can get access to the skills. Um, one of the things that's so exciting for us internally is the huge opportunities that are out there for people that are coming into the profession and those that are already in the profession. We're doing an awful lot of research and we have done for the last seven or eight years in particular, focusing very much on where the puck is going to be in five years time and 10 years time and making sure that we, we're as up to date on the training that's required to serve our members into the future. But also I would like to reach out to people out there that if you haven't thought of accountancy as something that might be for you, can I just ask you to take a pause and maybe think about that for a second? Because if I was to speak to my son, who's now five and a half, I would say there's probably very, very few other professions that I think uh, could engage somebody 
in the way the profession will going forward than accountancy. It would act as the ultimate springboard to any other part of working in business. And if you truly want to be uh, a business leader of the future, that is at the top of their game, the accountancy profession, there is no better foundation for that in my book. Now I will be biased, but I think it can excite people in ways they never thought they could get excited about. And we are, and we look forward to the future uh, very much. Great. Ian, it's been fascinating. Thank you very much for taking a day, hour out of your day to chat to us here. And that's the end of the podcast here this time around. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. If you are also passionate about these topics, I'd love you to reach out to me, james.kennedy at procurementexpress.com. If you're a customer at procurementexpress.com, I'd also love to come have you come on the show, have a chat about that. Um, or if you know someone who really should come along and have a chat here, share some of their knowledge, um, you can reach out to me and I'd love to hear from you. So until the next time, I'll say goodbye.